then one day my wife walks into our house and she says, I want my husband back. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, you're not the man that I married. And I said, what do you mean? She says, you haven't been the same since the NFL draft. Another great day in Montana, the big sky country. It's just, you understand why it's called that when you just see the vistas that we're experiencing every morning here. Man, I wake up and I think a lot about what we've gone through, what we've experienced. And what's amazing to me is you bring together a large group of guys that are very, very diverse, different nationalities, different uh, denominations, different perspectives, theology a little bit different, but they come together for one reason. They come together to, to love God, fellowship with each other, really get connected, and then turn their attention to the next generation. So I got a question for you. Here's a question. How many of you guys, I mean, you've all lived such lives of privilege and everything's been so good, but anybody in here had any trials that you've been through? Any testing in your life, right? That's a few hands and the rest of you just can't even raise your arm. You're so beat up, man. <laughs> Every now and then, man, I'll hear, I'll talk to some believer and they're like, man, just the Lord is so good. Everything, everything in my life is so good. And I just think, so you just came to the Lord yesterday, right? And you ain't done nothing since. So you haven't moved yet, right? Because that's not my experience, okay? My experience is one in which, yes, the Lord is good. He is always good. Yes, there is a plan. Yes, He has a plan and a purpose for our lives. It is a plan to give us hope and a future. He doesn't have a plan to harm us in any way. All right, check the box, done, put a period there. However, in this life, you will have tribulation. Now, he's overcome all that bit. You still got to go through it. You still have to go through it. I don't know a way around that. And I, I think there's, there's a, at times there's kind of a Christian mentality of just get me out of here. Get me out of here. Yes, I, I, I acknowledge the Creator. Yes, I thank Jesus for my salvation and my ability to transcend when I die. I'm on my way to heaven. And they want to accelerate the process. That's escapism. You were, uh, you were bought with a price. And you were redeemed for a purpose. And if the purpose was just to get out of here, that could have happened really fast. But as godly men, you have a call on your life. This is God's country. Uh, this, this view insp just inspires me. Picture mountain goats and elk going right straight up that mountain. You and I would go 50 feet and take a break. We're on their turf. We're going to be following this trail to an abandoned mine shaft. We'll be watching for rattlesnakes, and we want to be cautious, but I want most of all for you to just think about God's nature and what He has provided for us. There are thousands, millions of men who have never been in an area like this. Count our blessings. So you ready? Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Let's go. I'm from Saginaw, Michigan. This is different because I'm a city boy. At one point I was a country boy, but it wasn't a country like this. At least I knew where I was. Okay. I don't know, but I've been told. He don't know, but he's been told. Jesus Christ will save your soul. Jesus Christ will save your soul. Pick you up, turn you around. Pick you up, turn you around. Place your feet on solid ground. Place your feet on solid ground. Jesus. 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 And here's the deal. Everybody in life gets blindsided. We all get bushwhacked. We don't see something coming. We're just cruising along through life, and all of a sudden, it might be financial, it might be health, it might be relational, it might deal with employment, but bam, life changes. Being in the NFL draft and, and, and one night, you know, you're, you're excited. You can't go to sleep, you're so excited because you're, 
looking at being a second round draft pick and the next night you're laying in your bed going what in the world just happened you know you were standing on top of the world and that night the world standing on top of you and you find out that you got an issue with your spinal cord that that makes you more susceptible to being paralyzed and so uh two and 24 hours have something snatched away from you that was so near and dear you know you feel bushwhacked and uh you know i was like many other men who go through that you you kind of lose purpose in many ways i kind of became a walking zombie uh, loved God, didn't do stupid stuff, uh, but I had lost purpose. I lost passion for life. And uh, I'll tell you what turned it around. Uh, I kind of wandered for about five years, just lacking purpose, just kind of a walking zombie. And then one day my wife walks into our house and she says, I want my husband back. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, you're not the man that I married. And I said, what do you mean? She says, you haven't been the same since the NFL draft. You're not the man that I married. And she said, you were an All-American for everybody else. Now I need you to be an All-American for me. And that's all I needed to hear. I got up, I found purpose again, and here I am. Think of the movie Rocky when the music starts to play in the music Rocky and after he's been knocked down and you hear the dun 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 and Rocky stands back up to his feet and he's ready to go again. And I, I think what I learned at that time in my life of being bushwhacked is, is that um, sometimes when life knocks you down, you wait for the music to play, man. And the best thing you can do is stand up and, get, and just be ready to go one more round because that's all it takes to win is one more round. Yeah. Gifts for you. There is a call on your life. Now that might be a call to business. I'm not talking about just a call to the pastorate. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying that you were made for a purpose. You have gifts and talents that nobody else has. We talk about stand in the gap. There is a gap. We're in a war. It's a spiritual war. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We're not mad about other people. But it's a war. And if I don't stand up next to you, if I don't serve in my position, there's a gap. And whether it's football or military, when there's a gap, it's a bad thing. Because it means the opponent comes right through. And when he comes right through, he takes out the one that's defenseless. So in the context of next generation, a man of God's got to stand in the gap. We just need each other. We've got to stand shoulder to shoulder. All right? And what happens is in this life, we can be tired. I'm not talking about sleepy, I caught too many fish, and my belly's full tired. I'm talking about your soul becomes weary. I have been there, all right? And especially when you pick up your, your gifts and you begin to implement the call, you can get pulled upon. People need you. That's okay. But we can become weary. And isn't it interesting, when you get the weariest, is generally when you get hit the hardest. You know, like in, in my life, I had that wreck when I was 19. And uh, you're talking about blindside, I was doing anything I wanted to do. And you go from that to having relying on people to do everything for you. And, uh, you know, it really took you to that point. And it really, I've heard this, you've heard this saying, it's a cliche saying, but I've heard it and I really lived it. And the saying is, is what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I mean, that was very, very powerful. You know, I've learned that because I thought, well, this literally killed me. But on the other side of it, I was stronger. I had more wisdom out of it. Uh, I think a lot of things that we go through, the thing we get out of it is wisdom. You know, and, and you guys, people talking, you guys have said that. Well, you guys have, a, you have a lot of wisdom. But on this side, you see me now. But on the other side, you haven't seen what I've been through. You haven't seen the bushwhacked and the blindsided that I've gone, the nights that I've, I've been by myself, even married to my wife, but still by myself. Bushwhacked and blindsided. And, and bushwhack comes from riding horses in a, in a file. And that horse ahead of you catches a big branch and you're just riding along and everything's fine. You're just looking at the birds and pretty soon you're looking straight up at the sky because this bush came back and whacked you and knocked you off the back of your horse. Some of you have experienced that. And blindsided is where maybe you're running down the football field and all of a sudden that guy pulls a crack back block and catches you just above the short rib 
and your air goes somewhere else. But here's the deal. In either instance, it's, it's, a, it's a trial. It's a test. It's something that, that maybe you didn't see coming. All right. So let me, let's go here to, to James 1, 2 and see what it says. It says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. What's the context of asking for wisdom in this? It's in trials. You see the connection? Okay, you got to put these things together. So when you're in a trial, you know, you could, you could flip the dials and watch uh, Dr. Phil and so solve my problems, good luck. Okay? You could sit down with some guy that doesn't understand the Word of God, maybe isn't connected to the Lord, and oh, he'll give you counsel. But the wise thing is you go to God and you say, Father, I don't know what to do. I need wisdom now. I'm, I'm uh, having a problem with my child, with my son, in a relationship, with my job, financial, whatever it might be, with my health. And God will give generously. But what I want us to understand, guys, is that trials are going to come. Don't think it's strange. In the book of Peter, it says, don't, don't think it's strange when fiery trials come upon you. It's not strange. It's just part of life. Like we said the other night, one of my buddy, your, your hat on the back, it says, no whining. A man of God doesn't whine. Now, we can take time and sit down with another uh, brother and, and we can offload. That's different than whining because we need each other. Okay, you, don't, you keep everything inside, you become a pressure cooker. And all of a sudden, you're going to have an outburst of anger or violence or whatever. So you find the right guys and you sit down with them and you go, this is what I'm dealing with. I'm being tested. My faith is being tested. I'm being tempted. Porn's got its hooks in me. Fear has its hooks in me. Whatever it might be. Don't take that on alone. But don't run from it either. There's no shame in the truth. There's no shame in the truth. And often as believers, whatever we're being tested with or tried with, we become ashamed of. As if that's us. That's not you. It's just something you're going through. The shame is when you hide what you're going through. That's shameful to me. You put in darkness something that God's trying to bring to the light. So when you bring it to the light, especially with trusted brothers, you begin to pray about it. You get wise counsel. You become strong. You persevere. And then your faith grows. And as your faith grows, you are able to deal with tests and trials in the future that would stop you in your tracks today. This ministry is a total team effort and you can be part of that team. Perhaps you've got a location, a ranch or a retreat center with lots of outdoor activities where we could shoot our next series. Perhaps you could be a sponsor for one episode of the entire series or you could even be on the show. If you wanna help us to produce high quality Christian television, build strong families and great dads, please go to our website. Thank you. Guys, we've made our way up a mountain trail here. And one of the things that hits me as we're standing here is that we're surrounded by the remnants of a story. And we don't know all the details about the story, but one thing's clear. It's a story that involved sacrifice, hard work, and dedication. What we had were prospectors that came into this area. And it's real simple to understand prospectors. They were looking for the prospect of gold and riches. One of the biggest problems in hard rock mining is water. They would get under there and they would hit underground springs. So all your mines had to be at a certain grade so that the water would flow out. You couldn't go downhill or you'd be working in pools of water. They thought it was worth the sacrifice and the dedication. The guys that dug that hole and clawed and scratched to make a living, that wasn't fun. That was life. That was survival. And in our story, we have to make some choices. 
Are we going to live a story that's full of sacrifice, dedication, um, going after things? Or are we going to choose the easy road? They brought actual ore cars into this. And because of the size of the opening, those ore cars could have only been powered by one thing, a man. So they blasted, they had to get the ore that was worth nothing out of the way to find the ore that was precious. You know, one of the things that hits me is Jesus saying, uh, pick up your cross and follow me. And the thing I think about that is that Jesus, he was inviting us into something. And this path that we've been called into, it's going to be full of some sacrifice, some dedication. But along the way, we know that the rewards are going to be great. I'm pretty confident that whatever they found in here, our rewards are going to be even greater. We have to be convinced that it's worth it to dig in and hang in there. And if you dig for a while and it gets hard, then you really have to dig in. You can't give up on human beings. We just can't, guys. So I'm inspired. I'm glad we came up here. All right, guys, another day down in Montana man camp, man. Mr. Baker that I'm going to introduce you to here is one of the most successful guys I know. He's the CEO of a, of a good sized company. He has his own ministry, man. He brings together men from all over the place and they gather out at his, at his uh, barn, we call it. He's got lots of ministries, lots of things going on, world traveler. So this is a successful man, but a couple times in his life, that tree hit him, that, that linebacker got him. And he can tell that story a lot better than I can. So welcome, Scott Baker. You know, guys, I'm 51 years old, and I think in terms of stories. And so at 51, I'm now in, what, 51 chapters of a story. And Brian's right, you know, I've, I, I run a company, I've uh, been incredibly blessed there. I've got an incredible family. My 11-year-old son is here with us. Uh, he's number four for us, and just blessed way beyond. We should be. Uh, we, we should. Uh, I certainly should be blessed. But if you look back in the chapters of my story, the chapters of my life, if we go back to chapter 33, you would find the worst day of my life. Um, you would find a neighborhood, uh, a, a, a more of an upscale neighborhood in a community beautiful lawn, great looking house. And if we took the lid off that house on a Saturday at about 11 o'clock in the morning, you would see me, a dad, sitting on a couch, speaking to an eight-year-old little girl, my daughter, and sharing with her that her mom and dad are getting divorced. Worst day of my life. Because what I've learned about myself is I can take stuff that happens to me, but when you break the heart of one of your kids, it just sits with you. It sits with you there for a bit, and for me, guys, it it's it's it sat with me for seven to eight years because you're not supposed to get divorced. No one plans it, but guys, I didn't plan enough for it not to happen. Okay, so I went through seven or eight years of being introduced as yeah, this is, you know, this is a. Uh, um, you know, this is, this is my dad, and, and I, I'm at my dad's house, and I'm at my mom's house. Okay, and every time I'd hear that language, what was on my forehead was failure, was loser. You're one of those guys. And for seven to eight years, I just struggled with the ability uh, or inability to forgive myself. And for me, how I finally got there, guys, was a moment not unlike this. Uh, I was at a, uh, with Brian. We were doing a fathering thing. And Brian Pruitt, I think, was there. Dave Turner was there. Some of the guys were here. And, and Brian um, never signed up to speak with Brian. And I'll tell you why. I'm, I'm hosting this thing on a Thursday night. He tells me, <laughs> at the close on Saturday, I want you to speak about what happened in your divorce. And I'm thinking, Thursday night? I don't have time to prepare. I go, Brian, I got to get through all this stuff. How do you want to wrap it up? Just, 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 just you just worry about that one. I mean, what, how, what do you want me to talk about? Uh, you'll be great. And he hangs up on me. So for the next day and a half, I'm going, I've got to speak about this. And it was for the first time ever publicly. And it was in front of a group of men. And from that moment on, I finally felt that I could let myself go. That I could begin to forgive myself for what I thought I did to my kids. 
okay? And then um, time goes by, I get remarried. I've got two beautiful, beautiful um, uh, kids, 13-year-old Miss Hallie, 11-year-old Mr. Cole. And, in, and if you look at chapter 50 of my life, which was last year, um, going into September, I'm feeling great. And on Friday afternoon, 3.20 in the afternoon, I get a call from my doctor. And my doctor says, Scott, I've got the test results. I go, okay not expecting much come to the test results. And he says, Scott, it's cancer. My guess is a lot of people have wondered what it's like to get a phone call and have someone tell you you've got cancer. Well, I, I know what that phone call is like now. And when you hear the words, I gotta tell you what, it's pretty surreal. It's like, really? Really? Because, um, you know, I felt great. I really felt great. And when I finally found out how big it was, it was covering about 40% of my left kidney. So it was pretty big. But um, that first night's pretty bad. You're going from, you've got all kinds of emotions. I'll tell you what, even though I'm a CEO of a company, uh, the last thing you think about is work. Think about your wife. Uh, you think about your kids. I mean, I was even making mental notes of, okay, who's going to uh, step up um, and be the real the male role models for my kids if something happens. But uh, it's just a long night the first night. But uh, the thing with kidney cancer, guys, is you find it two ways. One way is you um, they're looking for something else and they find it. The other way is it likely is metastasized and it's gotten pretty bad. And, uh, you know, we were praising God that he sent a kidney stone because if there wasn't a kidney stone, I don't have a CAT scan. If I don't have a CAT scan, I don't know I have kidney cancer. So for two weeks between when I found out when they go to surgery to remove the tumor, my wife and I, what we wanted to model for our children is when life doesn't go your way, when the circumstances of life are not of your choosing, how do you respond? And uh, what we wanted to do was really teach the kids that, uh, you know, you go through it with strength. You know, Romans 5 tells us to, you know, there's something about perseverance. Perseverance building character and character building faith. And in, and in Jesus, faith does never, it just doesn't disappoint. So we did a lot of teaching for two weeks before the surgery. Uh, what ended up happening is they removed about a third of my kidney. Um, so my buddies now call me 1.7. And uh, what was really interesting after the surgery, I spent five weeks and uh, pretty much with me and God chatting. And what was interesting about that time was um, we, we didn't talk about my physical cancer. We didn't talk about kidney cancer. I think with him sending the kidney stone, he had that son of a gun under control. And one of the things I learned is you know, a physical cancer brings you in unity with God or closer to God, and I don't think his heart breaks for that stuff. So we didn't talk a lot about kidney cancer. What we spent a bunch of time talking about, though, guys, was um, the cancers um, that I had put in my body, that, that many of us put in our bodies, that his heart does break over. Uh, those are the cancers that separate us from him. And for me, it was things like, you know, I, I think of it this way, God had has this life for me. I'm living here. And what he and I spent five weeks talking about were those things that separate us, those cancers. Cancers like unforgiveness. Cancers like bitterness or resentment or anger. That's where we spent our time. And, uh, you know, our lesson about being blindsided and bushwhacked, I really didn't see that one coming. I just didn't see that one coming. And so as I go through trial, guys, we're all going to get punched in the face. We're all going to get bushwhacked and blindsided. It's going to happen. But the question is, is how do you respond when you get punched in the face? Are you going to go in the fetal position and just go away in a corner somewhere, go do unhealthy stuff, go justify bad decisions in your life? Or do you go to God? And I will pick God. Now there's a pretty cool story that, that ends up, you know, you, you get your cancer, you get it taken out, 
And then uh, fortunately for me, eight or nine months later, I find out I don't have any cancer cells, so praise God for that. The three things that got me through trial, okay? The three things got through me. One was God, it was just God. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but when you're in a place and you're having conversation with God, He doesn't talk a lot. He's a great listener. But when He does speak, it's, uh, it's as if He spoke volumes spoke volumes when you go through it. The other thing, I went through family. Great family, okay? Be in a great place with your spouse. Be in a great place with your kids. And the third one for me, and it is, I mean, I don't call it friends, I call it friendships. But having great friendships as you go through trial. And I shared with my friends afterwards, we had kind of a celebration, I said, you guys were part of the trifecta for me. You're part of the trifecta, God, family, friends. And uh, it just made it a ton easier for me um, to go through these two. And, and there's a language, guys, that I want you to wipe out of your vocabulary. And it's one that I hear from men way too often as I get with men. If only I had a better job. If only I made more money. If only, if only, if I only had what you had, Scott. If only I had what you had. And what they often don't have is Jesus Christ, right? And so I get them to turn their language around and go, in spite of having cancer, look what he has in store for you. In spite of whatever bad thing happens to you, um, God still has just an incredible plan for your life. So guys, thank you for your time. Brian, thanks for giving me a chance to share with the guys. Thanks. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> Good job. And see, he was so mad at me, man, that first time I invited him to speak. He, he was great. It's hard to preach through clenched teeth, man, but he was just up there, just, uh, but he did so well. And uh, it, it's awesome to see. So guys, we're all gonna get bushwhacked. We're all gonna get blindsided, right? And uh, the difference between the man of God and just the average guy is how we handle it. It's how we handle it. And I want you to remember this. The next generation is watching you. So when you get whacked, how you respond is what they're gonna do when they get whacked, all right? So that old thing about man up, it's a real thing. And you guys know me, I'm tough enough to cry. So it's not about that at all. It's not about that at all. But, but you, gotta, you gotta weep when it's time to weep. You gotta rejoice when it's time to rejoice. And a whole lot of times when you're not sure what to do, you just put that rod of iron down your back and you square your shoulders and you keep going. And God will meet you there and those friendships will be there. And if you're fortunate, somebody from your family will be there and we'll get through this thing. We'll get through it. Feels like rivers have flooded from my eyes as I change into a better man. I look up to the stars and know it's time to head back east.